So I saw Argyle a while back and I've come to the conclusion that spine movies are weird. It's gotten to the point where the genre in and of itself is so cliche that all that is left of it are parodies. Over-the-top, self-referential, self-aware, and all sense of stakes are thrown out the window when even the movie itself calls out their own cliches. But we still love them. Argyle starts off as this unrealistic Hollywood spy story being read from a book, only for the movie to say, hey, real espionage isn't all that glitz and glamour, but then it shows them ice skating around on an oil slick to single-handedly take down the big bad guy security guards, it ends up being more fantastical than the books that the main character is supposedly writing about to the point of having a literal Chekhov's gun hanging on the wall in a scene. The movie just doesn't know what it wants to do with itself, and so the audience stops caring and just stays along for the ride. But if we take a look back at the whole spy comedy genre with Kingsman, Johnny English, and Austin Powers, some far more satirical in nature than the other, but you get the idea. We see their roots are very much in the James Bond and Mission Impossible movies. Very much so James Bond, who is to spy movies what Sherlock Holmes is to detective stories. But with the sheer amount of spy movies out there, it is very easy to call the whole scene oversaturated. Wait a minute. Oversaturated? Cliché? Over the top and exaggerated? Sounds like the perfect subject for a musical! Rejoice, Starkid fans, for their sister channel, Tin Can Bros, Corey Lubowicz, Joey Richter, Brian Rosenthal, working with Talk Fine, Clark Backstresser, and Pierce Sabres, created their first scripted production, Spies Are Forever. This musical is one of those instant classics which I can't myself find any faults in, which is incredible considering, once again, this is their first scripted production. So come with me on this journey of it enlightenment as we discover how the spy movie musical subverted the genre by defying cliché with parody. Also, there are so many more Sound of Music references in this that I remember. Let's start at the very beginning. A very good place to start. Don't interrupt. So I have a list of cliches all done up here with the help of Reddit, trope lists, and many other sources, including my own personal knowledge of spy films. What we'll look at is how Spies Are Forever does more than your average parody that usually points and laughs at what other spy movies have done before them, and instead completely transforms the experience into a one-of-a-kind show despite what it's based on. Our ever-expanding list of cliches include, but are definitely not limited to, a prologue followed by overly long opening credits song, Spy and a partner, the I work alone line, boss being annoyed by agent, a tech person, female love interest, Russian is optional, arms deal, villain with a theme, Russian and German optional, interrogation scene, torture optional, double agent betrayal, gadget and disguises, naming locations on the screen, everything as a gun, casino, poker or blackjack game optional, agent going rogue, fake out death, Villain plan gets explained, a chase scene, and an undercover informant. Code words, optional. So now we have all this in mind, let's dive in to Spies Are Forever. We are starting off strong. Take them off your bingo cards, everyone, as we have naming locations straight into an interrogation scene. The man in question being tortured and interrogated is none other than Agent Kurt Mega. And if you're wondering where they get such a cool and badass name from, well, ask his parents because that is the actor's literal name. So Kurt Mega, the American Secret Service spy, is the tough as nails, balls of steel, cool and collected agent that we are all familiar with. There's nothing that can crack him except for our first cliché subversion of the show. He gives up the information due to tickling. Oh, and also plot twist, 
The reason the interrogator knows of this oddly intimate weakness is because he is actually British intelligence agent Owen Carver, played by Joey Richter. Owen Carver, you limey bastard. I knew it was you all along. That accent sure could use some work, though. Oh, sort of. It drilled 20 Russian security officers and our dear friend Ola over here. With efficient introductions and explanations out of the way, the two greatest spies in the world go back to back as we head into our overly long opening credits, accompanied by our opening song with the beautiful vocals of Mary Kate Wiles. Once a spy, always a spy, forever, forever. The warmest hello to the coldest goodbye. Remember, remember, spies never die. Spies are forever. Try to keep up, old boy. As they make their escape from the Russian facility, things keep going from bad to worse. As Kurt Mega is overly cocky, not wearing rocket shoes because they didn't go with his outfit, drinking whiskey on the way, tossing an unimportant banana peel on the walkway, and setting a timer for less time than they'd need to get out because they want to best their record. As they continue making their way out, they have my favorite type of choreography, the invisible chase scene. Cornered with no way out, the three minute timer on the bomb goes off and Owen slips on the banana peel. It's going to be the death of me. No, I never let you down. Whoa! That's what you get for having unhealthy amounts of foreshadowing in your musical. If you've seen my review of Time Bastard and Nightmare Time, then you'll know I'm a sucker for James Bond songs, and Mary Kate's performance is perfect. Simply perfect. Lurking in the shadows, watching your every move. The next scene opens in Budapest, 1961, with Kurt Mega now sporting an I am sad and it has been a while beard. He attempts to identify his informant for his next mission through the use of a code phrase that seems to piss a lot of people off. Yes, I hear the salty fish from down under is simply to die for. What the hell did you just say to me? Oh, is that one of them fancy drinks? We don't serve those here. Eventually, he finds the informant who is not so subtle as his Master of Disguise title would suggest. Esther Fallick is absolutely hilarious in this role. The way he switches from his disguise's voice to his own voice so seamlessly is a delight to watch. Once Kurt has received his briefing files, he breaks out into song about how he is old, sad, alcoholic, and really misses his partner, Owen. Wanna be a spy again, gonna try again, hop in a jet and fly again, grow a spine again, make it mine again, do my best not to cry again, and I know just where I'm going, me and my partner, Owen. Wondering what Owen would think of him now, he comes to the conclusion that since Kurt was once a spy, he must be a spy again, and turn his life around like how Owen would want him to. Owen would want me to do this, so I know that I'll get through it. Cause a spy is a spy, it's a spy, it's a spy, it's a spy. It's a spy, it's a spy. So what was that mission briefing for, you may be wondering? An arms deal. Take it off your bingo cards, involving my favorite character and song from the musical. Sorry I'm late, guys. Got a lot on my plate, guys. It's hard to juggle work and life. You see, tonight is date night. You guys can relate, right? Gotta do this thing with the wife. Sergio, the family man, played by Joey Richter, now that Owen has kicked the banana, selling bombs to support his wife and kids, stopping off at an arms deal before continuing on to his anniversary. Sergio is here to sell a bomb to the deadliest man alive and is being infiltrated by Kurt Mega, but also by a mysterious woman. Deadliest man alive disarms Mega in the most disrespectful way possible 
and then retreats while Sergio is left begging them not to shoot his bakery order for his anniversary. Thankfully, they show mercy, and Sergio goes free, but the Russian woman kicks Mega in the Mega Balls and makes her escape. And I got this. Richmond's Casino Monte Carlo. Damn, you still got it, Mega. At the end of the scene, we are given a sneak peek as to who the deadliest man alive was working for. Place your bets now, Russians or Germans? Who's it gonna be? Yeah, well, I know you're disappointed with the results, but you know you just weren't ready for prime time. Next up, Lauren Lopez once again knocks it out of the park with another role. The girl boss, Cynthia Houston, the director of the American Secret Service. Casually on the phone with people like Richard Nixon and JFK, which is the greatest way to solidify the time period, she wastes no time berating, poisoning, and insulting Mega and his beard. You grew that. Oh, fucking. This. This. Beard? Yes, a fucking beard! I think beards are fine. To ensure Mega was paying attention. She withholds the antidote to the poison she gave Mega until he can repeat back the whole mission brief. So clearly she doesn't do half measures, but even though she's hard on him, she believes he is a special agent and can get the job done if he actually focuses and keeps his eyes on the prize. And in her departing words of tough love, she checks if he is properly protected and safe. Oh, and Kurt. Yes. Oh! oh! God! Oh! <clears throat> Good, you're learning. Ah yes, the classic scene from all spy movies. The hidden gadgets to arm our secret agent scene. ASS Technology Labs is run by Barb Lavra. God, just saying her name out loud makes me feel like I've vomited in my mouth and swallowed it. Played by Tessa Netting, she has a very one-way crush on Mega, and in a very clever song that shows this fact as she does so much to keep him safe in the field, yet Mega pays no attention to her or what she's explaining about her gadgets. Listen and you'll know it works. What? I'm paying attention. Ah, shit. Yes! Ah. It's a lie detector! We do what we do So you can do what you do And while you're saving the world Who do you think we're saving you? This song has one of my favorite visual gags from this show as the scientists show that everything is a gun, including the razor and shaving foam. Razor and shaving cream, I think I know what this is, it's a gun. No, Daniel Boone, that's to shave that awful beard. You look homeless. Well, I thought, I thought, I thought beards were, I thought beards were cool. Fine, I'll go shave. I had to do it for the pun. Anyways, Mega arrives in a James Bond tuxedo complete with bow tie. I wish I had mine, but I've lost it somewhere, which means you know we've got poker, blackjack, or roulette game coming along. Bonus points for multiple, if not all. With a keep your eyes on the prize reprise, we see Owen on the upper balcony in the literal corner of Mega's mind. As Agent Mega searches for the informant, he hastily tries to get a gun, having to tase a waiter until finding the master of disguise at the blackjack table. In yet another subversion of a cliche, Mega's attempts at being suave all fail spectacularly, and his actions having consequences, as the waitress he calls over is stressed out due to them being a waiter down for some reason. As Mega attempts to regain his composure, my other favorite character walks in, Richie Big, but his friends call him Dick, as the red, white, and blue bleeding American. Joe Walker and Joey Richter are masters at performing as memorable supporting characters. They are like two sides of the same coin, and this scene is no exception. From the U.S. toast to honor. Hitting on her, getting on her, staying on her, and if you can't come in or come on her, God bless America. <laughs> to smelling the Second Amendment off of Agent Mega. 
The Second Amendment loving patriot is yourself. Red or black? And so far from home. Red! Hey, y'all! Are all bets in? This boy's back in hate! Yes, we're all in! All in, marvelous! At first, Dick is shown to be your average loud and obnoxious American man, hitting on Tatiana, the mystery Russian woman, but then it is revealed that he is a respectful man in disguise. He accepts Tatiana's refusal of his advances and advises Mega against trying also, saying brothers before others. He notices Mega is on a winning streak and follows him along, but when Mega loses his cool, Dick is ashamed to ever have called him a friend. You know immediately. Whoa, 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 whoa! Never in my wildest nightmares did I figure that I would be associated with a man who couldn't keep his cool under pressure, Mr. I don't seem to have caught your name. Mega. His name is Kurt Mega. Well, Mr. Kurt Mega, if that is your real name, you need to learn to respect the people around you. It's funny because I didn't think it was his real name either. This isn't even a spy movie cliche subversion. It's just a stereotype subversion, and I love it. His exit is even accompanied by a patriotic hell yeah from the audience. Good evening to the lady, and to you, sir, you burn in the fiery pits of Lucifer's hell. Good night. After all is said and done, though, Mega does get invited back to Tatiana's room, only to be betrayed and given up to the deadliest man alive. Double agent betrayal. Check. It's been revealed that mystery Russian woman Tatiana isn't working for the Russians, which, if you've been paying attention, means that the ones she must be working for are... Thank you, mein Führer. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, dear lord. I have to tread real damn lightly around this one, huh? Brian Rosenthal is Jewish and is playing Dr. Baron von not such a great person, who is probably the most harmless German soldier that you could come across, with a puppet of his uncle on his hand and a pocket full of sparkles. As Mega is tied to a chair, we are treated to a musical number that is propaganda incarnate. They literally do the whole Bo Burnham, I say hey, you say ho. Except they really get the audience to participate. Okay. Now say it with me, and I'll be looking for the ones who don't obey. Nazis are not so bad. 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 What the fuck is wrong with you people? <laughs> There's rightly some amount of controversy around the whole morality of making and performing a song like this, but it is just so cartoonish that I don't know how anyone could take this seriously. I mean, it's complete with a dance break filled with salutes and symbolism that just... Okay, I'm gonna move on. So Baron Von Not-So-Nice explains his evil plan. Oh, let's check that off the bingo cards. He wishes to take control of the New Democratic Republics of Old Socialist Prussian Slovakia, but any old Eastern European placeholder name will do fine. But additionally, Dr. German is working with Mr. Deadliest Man to build a super castle in the nation's capital. If the nation does not agree, then they will blow up the capital with the bomb they got from Sergio. Baron von Not Me leaves the deadliest man alive to have his fun with Mega before killing him torture scene number two. If you've seen my review of Epic the Musical, then you'll know how much I love callbacks to previous songs, and having those songs represent what the characters stand for, and what they embody, or even what they're thinking at any given point in time. Torture Tango is such a great song, with its own original swaying suave beat, but then it interweaves with Somebody's Gotta Do It, Spy Again, and more. Joe Walker, Kurt Mega, and Mary-Kate Wiles absolutely knock it out of the park with this one as Tatiana reveals she was blackmailed and double-crossed. Agent Mega refuses to go with her and has flashbacks to Owen, once again literally up there in the corner of his mind before getting shot in the back. Do I have character gets shot non-lethally in here? I'll put it in now. It's my list, damn it. And so ends Act 1. So if you couldn't tell, Agent Kurt Mega is very much inspired by James Bond, with his boss being inspired by M, and the gadget geek Barb being inspired by Q. However, these staples of the spy movie genre have key differences that make them stand out from the stereotypes that they're based on. 
The most obvious being Barb having a crush on Mega, however, depending who you ask, that may also be the case for Q and James Bond. That's why I believe in the subversion of these basic stereotypes that people have become familiar with in the spy movie genre. Spies Are Forever makes them more than punchlines. But in the process of making something new, they make the characters far more interesting and complex. Instead of the suave and charming James Bond going from lady to lady, Kurt Mega is what happens if you were to give James Bond a bond. Thank you. Thank you. I'm here all night. Mega being broken up about the loss of Owen sets him apart from the stoic and unwavering special agents that came before him, and yet don't brush deaths under the rug like most parodies would do. Everything has meaning when it happens, and nowhere is that more evident than in the casino scene where Mega casually tasing a waiter causes the next server he meets to be stressed because they are a waiter down. Similarly, Mega and Tatiana are stopped to pay for the drinks that Richie Big offhandedly ordered to his account, leading to yet another amazing supporting character being played by Joey Richter, just kinda doing his thing. And speaking of Richie Big, an absolute testament to Tin Can Bros writing sympathetic characters left, right, and center. From Sergio the bomb dealer just working for his wife and family, to Richie turning out to be, while obnoxious and American, completely reasonable as he makes his exit. Spies Are Forever, as we have been keeping track, not only hits the cliches and then transforms them into something far more impactful by twisting them just the right amount to keep us engaged on this wacky ride. Wonder how this wacky ride will continue into Act 2. What a wonderful night, what a fabulous sight, I hope you're enjoying your evening. Oh, politics, you crazy darn thing, you. In a song that made me realize why I had no friends in school, nobody says what they truly think about the prince while the mic is live, only to immediately follow up with a flood of insults once the reporter walks away. The gala includes the director of the ASS and the Russian dictator Vladimir Putin. Their words, not mine. As the prince is finally revealed, he is a character. What do you got to say for yourself, my man? guy ruling our country. Oh wait, remember how Kurt Mega was shot at the end of Act 1? Well here he comes, followed by one of the greatest flashbacks I've seen since Satisfied. God, you smell like puke! What the fuck happened to you? Oh, In the flashback, it was revealed that Mega has been thrown off the mission. So what would any self-respecting special agent do? Go rogue, of course, but in his efforts to out the nasties plan, the deadliest man alive decides to just off the prince instead of kidnapping him. With all things gone to shit, Mega freaks out and Tatiata has to bail him out of trouble again. Stop, stop, it, stop, it, stop, it, come on! <laughs> Without any strong evidence or investigation to support these claims, it'll be difficult to determine who is responsible for these crimes against peace, but... Based solely on my emotional response, I think it's safe to say that the world's superpowers have devised a plot against this. I'm sorry, turn off the camera, I can't. As we all know, there's no place safer than your mom's house. No, wait, I'm, I'm serious. Mega takes Tatiana to his mother's house, where we get some of that sweet, sweet backstory juice. Mega's father left when he was young, and Tatiana has a solo number about being made into an instrument of war by the Russians from the young age and her family has been held hostage by them ever since. All right, Black Widow, calm down there. Then the mood suddenly shifts. She's touching my hand. He's looking kind of funny. Wait, does she think I like her? Is this because I touched his hand? Because this is a spy movie, of course the guy's got to get the girl. So get your asses back to those bingo cards and check off We're not doing this. Wait a minute. In a song where they are singing what is literally on their mind, they fully acknowledge the stereotype they are about to follow through, yet the words that aren't spoken are so much louder here. 
This is probably the greatest thing that Spies Are Forever does with the whole show. I'm... You're not my type. I can tell. So you're into... Yeah. Ah. I thought you... I wasn't, but the mood suggested... Of course. <laughs> so we're just... Friends. Throughout the musical, there have been allusions to Agent Mega being less than your average straight man secret spy. Ticklish, picky about his outfit, oblivious to a woman's innuendo, sick at the sight of blood, freaking out and crying for his mommy, not having brought home any girls, ever. After Mega and Tatiana kiss, the penny drops with the force of a nuclear bomb. The bromance that Mega shared with Owen was actually a romance. There's a great video made by Savannah Limited, which I'll link in the description, that discusses the subtext of Kurt Mega being homosexual and the historical relevance that that would have in the time period the musical is set in, which you all should definitely check out when you can. Anyways, as the two agree that they are better off as friends, Mrs. Mega is busy planning their wedding, like any other oblivious mother of a closeted gay man would. So now that Agent Mega has gone rogue, and completely forgotten any stereotype that I have in my list that I made at the start of this video, you know, you know what? Let me just... He's traded out his tux for a leather jacket, and now he, Tatiana, the informant, and Barb are all back together. For the first time. And have emotional speeches, and another shot. One more shot, to be exact. I love this song so much. Especially when everyone starts layering over each other. It tickles my brain and makes me happy. Also, maybe getting shitfaced before uh, going on a mission is not the best idea. As the choreography just devolves into hopping about drunkenly, I really hope the hangover isn't too bad. So arriving late to the conference for no particular reason, the informant disguised as the Royal Notarizer infiltrates the meeting to see that Baron von uh, is working his sing-songy magic again to convince the remaining government of the Soviet Democratic... the new Democratic Republics of Old Socialist Prussian Slovakia to unite with the Germans and build a super castle which the deadliest man alive seems to be very adamant about. Suddenly, just as the informant is about to be discovered, Agent Mega and Tatiana burst into the room only for the deadliest man alive to stab a certain German's nephew in the back. Literally. After a last pocket full of sparkles, Dr. Baron von not alive anymore breathes his last. But now that the deadliest man alive has his signature and papers he was looking for, he reveals his true identity. Owen! What a twist! The real villain wasn't the Russians or the Germans, it was the British! After removing his Mission Impossible mask, Owen goes ahead and starts taunting the crew, half explaining his motivations and waiting for Kurt to figure out the answers. No, no, no. I've been manipulating von Nazi from the very beginning. The fool was an expendable puppet. I... Look at me! I keep glitter up my sleeves! Waka waka! No, 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 no. <laughs> no, no, no. But Agent Mega is just too stunned to see his old lover back from the dead. Any Star Wars fans should know that uh, falling down a pit is the least conclusive way of killing off a character. Filled with fourth wall breaking, self referential language, both to spy movies and the musical theatre medium itself, Owen reveals that his master plan is to make sure spies are no longer needed. That Kurt is no longer needed. Bird. Little birdies. His scientists developing. You are after the technology. Pop goes the weasel, an advanced Nazi information surveillance network to collect and archive state secrets. While the trio threaten Owen to hand over the technology, similar to how the bomb was so easily stolen and passed around, Owen explains 
It isn't something that can just be confiscated. They are massive servers on an island, so there's no point in going after Owen at all. So he simply makes his leave. Take caution. His partners don't tend to last. Always end on a high note, they say. Well, the fate of the world is in your hands, Kurt. Are you going to go after me? Or are you going to go after the machine? I think I know which one you'll choose. Oh, and Tatiana, don't slip up. I guess this is where my story ends, huh? In the old socialist new democratic But Kurt isn't here for the mission anymore. Now it's personal. So let's cut to the chase already. Oh wait, that's the name of the scene. I didn't realize. Huh. Great minds think alike. I love a good old epic reiteration of an opening song. It's like hearing the opening theme while watching an anime. One step ahead as Kurt and Owen face off across a series of transportation and weaponry. Meanwhile, Tatiana attaches the bomb she stole earlier in the show and attaches them to the brown rocket shoes, while Mrs. Mega is having refrigerator problems? Anyways, as we reach our final climax, Kurt and Owen face each other down. After the island facility has been destroyed, Owen reveals that there are others. That the group he is a part of, Chimera, shall keep going even if Kurt kills him here, or if they destroy the island facility. The speech given by Owen is very relevant now, with the rise of artificial intelligence beginning to replace the human workforce. There won't be any agency to go back to once the system is global. I'm going to single-handedly dismantle everything you've ever believed in. Man versus Machine. A tale as old as technology itself. But in this moment, Kurt doesn't look at the bigger picture. In this moment, he isn't facing off against Owen to stop his master plan. He's facing against Owen to finally be free of his memory. To finally move on after four years of grief. What about our secret? The time we shared. The feelings we had. For each other. You ready to share that with the world? After hearing that Owen no longer cares about the feelings they shared with each other, Kurt finally moves on. So after all that, Agent Mega is forgiven for going rogue, and gets a promotion for his duty to his country, and gets knighted by the Queen of... Nah, no, not really. He gets his ass handed to him. Although the director, Cynthia, leaves him on good terms, Agent Mega, now just regular Mega, meets up with Barb, who is moving workplace, and with Tatiana, who he gives new passports to for herself and her family. He gets a call from his mother, and after an It's not over yet statement, Kurt makes a speech about how man is greater than any machine and how spies are forever. You can break a computer box, but you can't break the will of a man. And that's why he'll never stop us. Even when we're buried six feet under the ground. Because spies, spies are forever. Subverting expectations are not. Gotta have that cheesy ending. Also, with that Marvel post credit scene, Kurt Mega will return text. Woo! Spies Are Forever is a wonderfully crafted story about a man trying to move on from the feelings of grief that he experienced due to a tragic loss in his past. Obsessing over his old self and his old partner, finally learning to let go and move on. Notice how it isn't about a spy being tasked with a mission to save the world and get the girl at the end? 
That is what makes Spies of Forever stand out more than any spy movie or parody that's out there. The characters come first. They aren't just the tech guy or the bad guy or the I know a guy. Each of them feel alive through the show to make it feel less like it's using the spy movie cliches and their subversions as a crutch or a shortcut. They perfectly use them as tools for storytelling and comedy. It doesn't just make fun of spy movie tropes and instead defies the cliches and forges its own identity as more than just a parody.